Running Aces Casino and Racetrack is the Twin Cities' premier choice for exciting entertainment. 24-7 gaming and dining, monthly comedy shows, and $1 blackjack with no commission or ante, making it the most player-friendly casino around. Trout Air Tavern at Running Aces offers Minnesota-inspired handcrafted dishes with locally sourced ingredients and the trout that made the area famous. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, 25 minutes north of downtown. Visit RunAces.com. Running Aces, your night out is waiting. TCL is a proud sponsor of the 1500 ESPN Studios. TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. All right, Mackie and Judd, and uh, let's let's get him in here. Sage Rosenfels. That, I'll say this was an amazingly entertaining game to watch last night, and for a while it felt like the Vikings were gonna were gonna pull it out. Sage, I have a, I have a hot take for you to start things out. All right, are you ready? Let's do it. So. I know that the Vikings defense is getting absolutely savaged for their lack of performance last night. My main takeaway was, okay, the Vikings defense definitely could have played better, but Jared Goff was absurdly good in that game. I came away thinking a lot more about Jared Goff and Sean McVay than I thought negatively about the Vikings defense. Is that fair? Well, I think I think it's fair in the sense that uh, Goff's a good quarterback. I mean, I think that's the deal. That's why he was drafted number one overall. Uh, I, I think that this game has so many fun things to talk about, even if you're bummed out because you're a Vikings fan. But you know, one of these things is the Rams' offense: Jared Goff, Sean McVay, uh, that whole combination. It's great to talk about. And and you know, Goff is that he's a talented kid. He got a nice arm. He was an accurate quarterback. Uh, if anything, this one, it goes to show how important coaching is in the NFL, in particular for a quarterback, what type of system he's in, the details of that system, you know, the coach that's coaching that system and, and all those things and, and how that can be the difference between a guy who two years ago looked like an absolute bust, uh, and now a guy that looks like an MVP candidate. I mean, he was phenomenal last night. Um, watching that game and, and, and the, some of the plays that were diagrammed uh, and, and designed and created by McVay uh, gave Goff a huge advantage, and 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 he, you can tell he knows exactly where he wants to go with the football. Uh, he's not jittery back there. Uh, when that ball hits his hand, he knows exactly what he's supposed to do, what he has to do. Uh, and to me, that's all because of Sean McVay. I've been sort of preaching about how good Sean McVay uh, is. Uh, you know, going back to his, his Washington days as the offensive coordinator. I've known the guy for a while. He's an absolutely fantastic coach. It's a part of that uh, that uh, Shanahan tree that I had most of my success with, uh, you know, with the Houston Texans before I came up to Minnesota. So um, this is the result of that. The talented kid who's really being coached really well by a guy who's creating some great plays to give his offense incredible matchups, and we saw a lot of that last night. So, Sage, what does a guy like McVay identify or see or scheme up that, that separates him from most? So when when you think, talk about that, I, I think you know a lot of coaches they they have this thing where go you know this is our system and these are the plays that we run and and you know I was at a, a, an old team years ago or this last team I was on we had a lot of success and I was the quarterback coach and now I'm the coordinator and this is the plays that we run and this is our system. McVay obviously he has his you know concepts that he likes but he's he's creative in the sense that he's totally fine with sort of breaking the rules um, of what he believes in because he sees a he sees a detail or something in the coverage that can be taken advantage of. And we saw that last night. Here's a classic example. Uh, that the, t- the first touchdown, I believe it was the first touchdown uh, to the running back, Gurley. It was about a, about a seven or eight-yard pass uh, right there in the red zone. And Gurley sort of ran like a seam route uh, out of the backfield. And in that, you look at the coverage on the replay, uh, the Vikings are in a bit where they would call a cover four. But a lot of times what happens in cover four is the backside safety, and I can't remember if it was Zendejo or, or Harrison Smith, uh, they sort of cheat and they sort of move to the strong side to try to help out because the linebacker, the middle linebacker is all by himself on the strong side. So they knew this, that the quarter, that the, the safety would cheat over to the three man, three man side in a, what we call a trip set. So because of that, and, and when Harrison, uh, I think it was Harrison Smith, when he cheated over, uh, and rather than having the running back just run sort of a, a check down or a flat route or something like that, he actually had him run a seam route. And I promise you, uh, and even though uh, Anthony Barr has played a lot of linebacker in the league, he has not seen too many seam routes out of the backfield by a running back. 
uh, and it ended up being a, you know, basically a wide open touchdown. Uh, you know, it's a very, really, really tough play for McVay to, to try to, to try to handle because he has to cover, you know, Gurley really all over the field. And usually you think lateral, but in this situation, it was a vertical concept. And that's something Will linebackers just aren't accustomed to. So, Sage, if you're Mike Zimmer and you, your defense has had its struggles basically ever since the second half of the New Orleans game in the playoffs last year, where do you go from here after getting blasted by the Rams last night? What, what is next for this defense? Because it seems like there's a lot of work to do on that end. Yeah, and, that, and that's the biggest, a real big concern, obviously. We're all seeing it. It you know, sort of baffles all of us. They've spent a ton of money on the, that defense. But you know, I, I think all of us would say that the dollars that were spent when they signed those contracts, we were all happy with. You know, it's, it's fans, the analysts, uh, you know, as, as coach, the coaching staff. I don't think they signed guys that were not talented players to big contracts and, you know, really regret giving people a lot of money. I, I think they did a really good job of that. They've got really good players on the, uh, on that team, but, you know, obviously right now they're just sort of getting worked over. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly why that is. Uh, you know, I've said it on this show. I've written about it many times. This isn't really a complex defense. You know, this is not what Mike Zimmer believes in. He believes in having, uh, your three or four, uh, sort of different coverages, uh, having a couple, you know, fairly basic blitz. We all know about that double A gap blitz that does give some teams some trouble. Uh, but that he, he, he's a big believer. And if you really know what you're doing well, uh, and your basic concepts, uh, you can sort of overwhelm an offense by knowing all the ins and outs of, uh, of what an offense does and, and, you know, what teams try to do to attack those basic coverages. So, uh, you know, did, does he change it up? Does he start running coverages that he's not used to? Does he try, start trying to blitz more and, and go into maybe a three man front and doing things they're not accustomed to? I don't know if that's the answer. This is not what Mike Zimmer does. It's, you know, he's been coaching for a long, long time. Uh, he has certain things he truly believes in, and my guess is that he's going to stick to his guns. Well, Sage Rosenfeld's with us here. He's a, he's a weekly guest on our show on Fridays, and you can find him on the Purple Podcast a couple times a week, too, with Matthew Collar, 1500ESPN.com, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you would find podcasts. Kirk Cousins is on pace along with two other quarterbacks, too, by the way, to break the all-time yardage record. I know it's super early in the season. We're still, you know, we're not even to October yet. But how do you balance his performances so far with some of the things that maybe raise red flags, like the fact that he fumbles more than any other quarterback in the league the last four years or so, and he seems to not have the greatest clock when he's standing in the pocket, but he still puts up these numbers. What's your read on him so far? Well, I think that's a legitimate concern, you know, that the fumble last night, that, you know, that was a huge play in the game, and there was definitely room to step up in the pocket. It seems like most of his fumbles come of this variety when he's in, in sort of the back of the pocket and somebody comes around and, and knocks the ball out of his hands. And my, my guess is Kevin Stefanski, the quarterback's coach, uh, will we'll be working with him uh, on this, you know, probably the rest of the year, you know, trying to get him to step up, step up in that pocket more. You, ha- you have to, of course, have a pocket to step up into. I will say this, by the way, and the, and the Vikings offensive line's gotten a, a lot of, uh, a lot to give them a hard time, you know, so far this year. Uh, shoot, I've given them a hard time this year. I thought they played pretty well last night. I mean, they were asked to drop back. Uh, you know, they threw about 50 passes last night or something like that. Uh, and then for the most part, I think they did a really good job of trying to keep Kirk Cousins clean. I, I think the issue is they're not running the football. You know, they're, whether they're just, they get behind right away and they just start decide that they're going to start throwing it. Uh, or they just want to throw it more because they have cousins. They have this, you know, guy who's got the strong arm. They think they can put up a lot of yardage and, and maybe score a lot of points. Uh, but, you know, to me, uh, I think that might be part of the issue, you know, with the defense. Obviously, they're giving up a lot of points and a lot of yards, but, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you know, they always say your best defense sometimes is a great offense. And let's say a great offense that runs the ball keeps that deal off the, that defense off the field. Uh, one keeps in and also keeps them fresh. So when they're on the field, uh, you know, that they're super energized. And so, you know, there's sort of a combination play here, offense and defense that work hand in hand together. Uh, I really wish that Kirk Cousins wasn't on pace to break the NFL mm-hmm. record for most passing yards. Uh, cause, you know, a lot of times that, uh, that's not a good thing. And in the last couple of games, it's because, uh, you know, the Vikings have been behind, uh, in, you know, in these, in these losses and, and the tie and have been trying to catch up. So Sage, since 2015, uh, Kirk has fumbled the ball 35 times and lost 14. How much of that is a product of pockets collapsing and things that can't be avoided by him? And how much of that circles back to, to having to have a, an awareness of pressure 
that oftentimes is coming from your blind side. Yeah, that's the hard part. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, when I was out there playing, I was always terrible at, you know, sort of feeling it from my weak side. And I was always blown away. of like, how does Aaron Rodgers do this? How does Tom Brady know Drew Brees? It's almost like they have this, you know, sixth sense of, of feeling when somebody's right behind them. I, 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 can, I can remember a lot of the times where I'm hit right in the middle of the back or somebody comes around and swipes the ball in my hands, and I had no idea what they were there. So it's hard for me to give advice uh, to give advice to, to another quarterback on you know how you sense that because I always struggle with that myself. I think some people just have it and some people don't. Uh, you know, I think all you can really do is again, uh, if Kevin Stefanski, if the offensive coaching staff can try to get Kirk to step up in the pocket, uh, to stay on rhythm, to try to go through his uh, through his progression as quickly as possible, not hold on to the football. Uh, and sometimes the best thing to do is just to throw the ball away and move on. And, and you know, a lot of quarterbacks like to hang on to the football for a bit too long, and more often than not, bad things happen rather than good things. So, Sage, with the running game and Dalvin Cook, I mean, he had 10 carries last night for 20 yards, two yards a carry, and we know he's not, not 100% right now, and I think they had him on kind of like a, a carries restriction or a pitch count me and Judd were talking about last night on Ventline. How do you, if you're the Vikings, how do you get the running game going? I mean, you can't really rebuild your entire offensive line on the fly. I mean, you have to kind of stick with what you've got and just hope that guys stay healthy. But how do you get this running game going? Because they're going to need to be able to establish some form of a running game if they're going to stay balanced offensively. Well, they have to. They absolutely have to run the football. I mean, if you uh, ask Mike Zimmer, what is your uh, you know, your sort of game plan. What is your strategy of how you win football games and how you get to the playoffs? You'll say, you know, great defense, run the football, protect the football, execute on offense, good special teams. I mean, you know, run the football is a, a major aspect of that. And if you can't run the ball, you know, it puts us in all these passing situations and it, it you know, it, it gives defenses opportunities to strip the ball, you know, from Kirk Cousins. And so, yeah, running the football is absolutely huge. And whether you do it on first down, second down, you know, the hard part is if they run the ball on first down, they, they become this team that everyone hates. It's like, oh, the team that runs the ball first down, second down, and then they're super boring and super predictable. So we don't want that, obviously, right? So to me, uh, it's if they throw the ball on the first down, they got to get some completions. They got to set themselves up in, in second short, second medium, uh, you know, these situations where, you know, running the football is a, in a very advantageous place to be. So they got to figure it out, you know, one way or another. And, and, uh, you know, there's, that I, I truly believe that the offensive line uh, is is built better uh, and, and, and plays better as a more of a running team than a straight drop straight drop backing team. So, uh, in my opinion, even if they get behind early, they get behind by ten points in the second quarter. You got to sort of stay the course, play the marathon game, and keep running the football because that, that also really helps your defense keep them off the field too. I think we have. It feels like we've got a little post-traumatic NFC Championship game stress syndrome here as Vikings fans and followers. Like every time the Vikings go to the NFC Championship game and get beat in devastating fashion, there's expectations for the, the following year and they fall flat. And I think you know it's it's hard to say that any of those previous rosters or or eras correlate in any way but it it I, I understand why fans feel that way after a slow start to the season and the eagles on the schedule coming up next this here we go again another letdown when you thought you might take the next step sage well there's what people don't realize when you win a championship game uh or you get to the championship game or you get deep in the playoffs then you add a few players uh you know that you think you've improved your roster um, you're also going to get a, a much tougher schedule. You know, you're going to get the schedule where you play all the other, you know, winners of the division, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, during the, during the regular season. And so your schedule is usually, you know, going to be tougher. I, I also believe this. And I said this at, at the beginning of the year, a couple of different radio shows that I would do. I would talk about how many games I thought the Vikings would win this year. And I truly thought it was going to be more like nine or 10 games. And yeah. people thought I was sort of crazy. Like, you know, this is a team that should win. 12, 13, 14 games to have a chance to go to the Super Bowl. And I thought to myself, listen, it is hard, very, very hard to win NFL games. It's very easy to lose them, extremely easy to lose them. And last year, everything just sort of seemed to go right for them, it seemed like to me. You know, the, the ball bounced the right way. They get a timely turnover. Uh, uh, you know, the quarterback case would sort of make a, a, a timely play. Uh, you know, the, 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 the defense would do a couple of things early. They'd get up by 14 points and just sort of, rely on that defense in the running game to sort of hold that lead. And, you know, they won 13 regular season games. 
that, 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 you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, uh, talent and coaching that goes into that, but there's also a lot of luck and, uh, you know, that they, they, you know, obviously Cook was out already this year. Um, yeah, I think, I think losing Pat Shermer is something that hasn't been talked about. And this is not a, a hit on John DeFilippo at all. Uh, but you know, you get really used to an offensive coordinator, how he calls plays, how he designs plays. But what coordinator, uh, has the entire team sort of thinking the way he does. That takes time. Uh, and even though he was only the coordinator for, you know, a sort of a shorter amount of time after taking over from North Turner, you know, he was around that office and that, you know, that building as a quarterback's coach for that for a couple of years too. So, you know, they lost that voice, the voice of the offense. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, John DiFilippo you know, hasn't quite, you know, captured that room yet. And, and that should be something that, you know, we really don't talk about much. But I tell you, we talk, we talk about John, the Sean McVay how important coaching is and the details of a head coach and all those things. Well, they have a new offense court, new offense, new, new quarterback. Uh, you know, those are two big variables uh, that have yet to totally gel yet. Yeah. Great stuff. Sage, we love these conversations. We'll talk again next week, man. See you, Sage. All right, guys. Looking forward to it. All right. Sage Rosenfels. Also find him on the Purple Podcast on a regular basis with Matthew Collar. Back with more Football Hour next on Mackie and Judd. This episode presented by Minnesota's very own Ticket King. If you're looking for tickets to a game or concert, visit TicketKingOnline.com or the link on the 1500 ESPN sports calendar page. Seats to fit every budget at all venues and all stadiums with zero fees added at checkout. Visit TicketKingOnline.com or call 612-341-4141. Napa Know How. Keeping it simple is usually a good thing. And when it comes to rewards programs, keeping it simple is always a good thing. That's why we made the Napa Rewards program effortless. All you need is your phone number to start saving on the parts and tools you need. Then we automatically give you $5 off your next purchase for every 100 you spend. So start saving today with Napa Rewards. Quality parts, helpful people. That's Napa Know How. Napa Know How. The Kavanaugh nomination. I'm Ed Donahue with an AP News Minute. The Judiciary Committee advanced the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court to the full Senate after Arizona Republican Jeff Flake asked for a one-week investigation into sexual assault allegations against the nominee. I'm prepared to do it, uh, make a request to the White House to ask the FBI to do that investigation. It would be short and limited in scope to the current allegations that have been made. At the White House, President Trump says senators have to do what they feel is right. All of the people, including Senator Grassley, who's doing a very good job, uh, that'll be a decision that they're going to make, and they suspect uh, they'll be making some decision soon, whether to take a vote or to do whatever else they want to do. I will be totally reliant on what Senator Grassley and the group decides to do. And Brett Kavanaugh's friend, Mark Judge, says he'll cooperate with any law enforcement agency that investigates confidentially. I'm Ed Donahue.